I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. takes place in presidential politics now that isn't done with an eye to what kind of an image you're going to be creating on television. Television affects every election. I probably did more television than some of my predecessors. Uh, there's no question that Ronald Reagan is a superb communicator. Rather than many individuals. Hugh Frank, close. Take your shot. Hold. Hold. This is Margaret Thatcher getting elected. She's doing it by television. Nowadays, an election campaign is what people see on television. If you go back to before the aid of television and ask yourself what a, an election campaign consisted of, I think you'd have to say, well, it was big public meetings in the local constituency, canvassing, election addresses. Most of that has now disappeared as an important part of an election campaign. Television is by far the most effective medium now. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your wonderful welcome to South Bradford tonight. Most politicians will do almost anything to appear on television, especially during an election campaign. The devastation of industry goes on. The destruction of services goes on. People believe what they see and hear on television. They're very skeptical about what they read in the press. People feel that they've simply got more information on which to judge the truthfulness of what they hear and see on television than they do if they're reading a newspaper. Millions who thought... This program examines first what television has done to the election process. NBC Television. In America, television's main function is to sell advertising. Camel, In the early 50s, it was thought that if television could sell products, it might also sell politicians. I for president, I for president. You like Ike, I like Ike. Everybody likes Ike. For president, play out the batter, beat the drum. We'll make Ike do what we want Ike! General Eisenhower was running for president in 1952. His first use of the visual medium would affect the way politicians would campaign forever. If parties are represented on television, they're represented by people, and so it could be argued that people are judging the politicians rather than the parties. Eisenhower hated television, so television advisers were brought in to promote him. He never felt easy until the actor Bob Montgomery was brought in, and he got Ike to be easy. He forgot about the camera. He just talked to the people who were asking the questions, and I thought came over extraordinarily well. It's doubtful whether television had much effect on the general's vote during the election. Eisenhower was a war hero and would have won anyway. But television surely saved the skin of Richard Nixon in that election. The press accused him of having an illegal campaign fund, and Eisenhower threatened to drop him as vice president. In desperation, Nixon decided to use television to sway popular opinion against the press. He decided that the only way he could handle the problem with part of Eisenhower's staff uh, against him and some for him uh, was to come back and make a tele dramatic televised speech. I own a 1950 Oldsmobile car. We have our furniture. We have no stocks and bonds of any type. I should say this, that Pat doesn't have a mink coat, but she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat. And I always tell her that she'd look good in anything. We did get something, a gift. It was a little cocker spaniel dog, black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Checkers. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep him. 
Why do I feel so deeply? Why do I feel that in spite of the smears, the misunderstanding, the necessity for a man to come up here and bear his soul as I have? Uh, he defended himself not by talking about the issue, although he gave it short shrift, but by talking about the fact that he, appealing emotionally, he was just a plain man, and he got away with it. Liar and right, the Republican National Committee, whether you think I should stay on or whether I should get off. I'm going to continue this fight. I'm going to campaign up and down in America until we drive the crooks and the communists and those that defend them out of Washington. And remember, folks, Eisenhower is a great man, believe me. Time for this great great program man. has now elapsed. Nixon was cut off in mid-sentence, but his appeal had done the trick. Telegrams by the tens of thousands swamped Republican headquarters in Washington. The unscheduled campaign drama builds and builds. After fulfilling speaking obligations, Senator Nixon flies to Wheeling, West Virginia for a meeting with General Eisenhower. Ike personally greets him, says to Nixon, you're my boy. Probably that speech had more impact and response per viewing set than anything in television history. I think that's unquestionably true. If this was a demonstration of the way politicians could harness the new medium, the BBC in Britain in the 50s were determined television shouldn't meddle in elections. Well, there was a theory that um, the BBC must at all costs not be seen interfering uh, with the electoral process. Uh, and that, incredible though it seems today, meant uh, that the course of the election was not reported in news at all. There was no coverage on television or radio of any kind of an election campaign. Now, we thought this was rubbish, and uh, if television had any function, it was to inform people about what's going on in the country, about politics, and the most important time of all was just before voting. We therefore wanted to change the practice. Our cameras are inside the counting room at Rochdale Town Hall, and Brian Inglis is waiting there for you. Good evening. I'm standing right inside the counting room at Rochdale. Around me, the count to decide this first television by-election is going ahead energetically. If television was to cover elections, what were the rules? The candidates got together themselves and came up with a formula which was equal time. And of course this was right, because the moment you come to think about it, uh, once a writ's been issued and there's, a, there's an election, whether it's a general election or a by-election, uh, the, the slate's wiped clean. And each candidate should have an equal chance and equal time to present his case. And uh, that has remained the same ever since. It meant that if the then Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, appeared on election television, Hugh Gateskill, the opposition leader, must have equal airtime, ensuring he could reach the same audience. Français, le 28 octobre. But in France, there were no such niceties as equal television time. De Gaulle denied his opponent's use of the medium because he considered television part of the government. It would prove a mistake in a democracy. De Gaulle made the mistake of thinking that uh, if you control the television networks, you control people's votes. I mean, this is something that uh, French politicians, at any rate, left, right and centre, cannot get out of their heads. Good evening. The television and radio stations... This is the first clear case of television influencing an election result. In the presidential debate of 1960, Richard Nixon would be compared directly with John Kennedy on the same television platform. At the CBS studios in Chicago that night, some seemingly minor and trivial things happened that would affect television politics forever. The challenger, John Kennedy, had surrounded himself with some very tough professionals who knew a lot more about television than did Nixon and his advisors. The studio was quite warm. We thought that maybe it should be cooled down a little, and we decided not to do that, just to leave it the way it is, because uh, Nixon was the kind of person who sweated a lot in heat. When the debate started, it became clear not only that his makeup was bad, but that this warmth of this studio uh, was making him sweat a lot. CBS, who ran the debate, told him that they would have a dark background. Nixon would stand out better with a light suit. They painted a very, very light background. Kennedy showed up in a dark suit, leaving a very strong suspicion that he was told this was the way it would be done. Senator John F. Kennedy. Mr. Smith, Mr. Nixon. In the election of 1860, 
Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. We had an agreement of, of having a reaction shot of the opposing uh, candidate because I thought that it would be down to the benefit of Kennedy. And I knew that uh, the candidate Nixon had a, a tendency to perspire and that somewhere along the line he might wipe his brow. And I felt that, again, would be in our favor. Then Richard Nixon began. But all the viewers at home remembered was what he looked like. Uh, I think that the reason that I voted... He had been advised to wear makeup every time he went on television for years and years. He refused to allow a makeup man to come near him in that debate. After that debate, we went out and hired the best Hollywood makeup man we knew. But Kennedy's professionals hadn't finished with Nixon yet. I'd suggest it, that they both stand. Nixon had the misfortune of being in the hospital with a bad leg, and standing on the bad leg forced him to shift his weight during the debate, and I just felt that would redound to the favor of Kennedy. While the overwhelming number of people who saw the debates believed John Kennedy had won them, the equally overwhelming number of people who only heard them didn't have a television set, listened on the radio, thought Richard Nixon had won them. Which shows that it is not so important what you say on television, but how you present it, the fashion in which you appear on television. Thank you. Television's weakness when dealing with politics had been exposed. Nixon, who had used television so effectively in 1952, had lost in 1960, mainly because of his image. In 1964, Harold Wilson was well aware of Kennedy's success when he began campaigning to become Prime Minister. The high point of the month was his solo party political broadcast. He was watched by the biggest audience ever known in Britain. 21,500,000 people saw the broadcast. Britain's influence will never be what it ought to be if we don't succeed in tackling the economic problem. He was a young man in his 40s, and television was just becoming important. And he was the first party leader and prime minister at a young age to come into the, the business of television. But so long as I'm prime minister of a conservative government... Harold Wilson's opponent was Sir Alec Douglas Hume. He was a good public speaker, but he never liked television or understood it. Or into our practice. I ought to have done more. I mean, you know, I think I ought to have practiced it more, but I, I never knew I was going to be a Prime Minister. It hadn't occurred to me. Well, let's be generous. They're talking about 3.5% now because it's election year. Wilson had planned his entire speaking campaign for television, including how to handle hecklers. How much is that on £3.7 and 6 a week? I think I can get through without help. I'm just going to make this speech my own way, if you don't mind. And I'd just like you to know it is my own speech. I wrote it myself. It wasn't... Wilson knew the television microphones wouldn't pick up the sound of the heckler, so Wilson himself could use the incident for his television audience. But if you don't want me to deal with pensions, there are many pensioners here who do, and I propose to do it. Now, so far... In a moment, in a moment. Now, do sit down. The audience, your own people particularly, really like to see you deal with hecklers. I mean, of course, if you get a bit of heckling on television, it's, 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 a, it's a great gift, provided you know how to handle hecklers. I wouldn't take any notice of them, ladies and gentlemen, just let them be. Douglas Hume didn't know how to handle hecklers on television. He hadn't realised the sound favoured him, and he tried to outshout a rowdy audience at Birmingham. I always thought that one of the marks of democracy in this country was that we were allowed to hear the other party's case. Well, I'm going on speaking so that everybody hears whether they like it or not. It was a television disaster. I, I rather blame myself for not studying the techniques of television more than I did. Now, I looked hunted rather by the sheer noise and impact of noise. And that had a bad effect. I think the election, began, we lost by a short head, but I think it just began to turn at that point. Rather than cover political issues, television was concentrating on the leaders. Like Nixon, this presented Sir Alec with an image problem. I said, can you make me look a bit better than I do on TV? I look all scraggy and like a ghost. Or the woman on the TV was making me up. She said, no. I said, why not? She said, because you've got a head like a skull. And so I said, but hasn't everybody got a head like a skull? And she said, no. And that was a finish of the conversation. Thank you, sir. The Labour Party won by a tiny majority. But with 600 seats being contested, could Harold Wilson's solo performance on television have influenced that result? Labour just won. They got an overall majority of five. And I don't think it would be too far 
far-fetched to say that uh, television must have been a major contribution to Labour's very slender victory at that election. Inadvertently, the BBC itself might have had an effect on the outcome of that election. On polling night, the BBC had scheduled a repeat series of step Town sound, which was an enormously popular programme. Well, Harold Wilson heard about this step and sound repeat, was worried about it, came to have a drink with me, and we talked about it. When I introduce Delia to you, and you shake hands, whether you stand up or sit down, it's going to be rude out of work. We decided to shift it to nine o'clock, the time the polls closed. And when I told Harold Wilson about that on the telephone the next day, he said, well, Hugh, thank you very much. That might be worth a dozen seats to me. And I've often, as he won by four, I've often wondered whether I should have a bad conscience. In the 1965 presidential election in France, de Gaulle, under pressure, was forced to give his opponents equal television time. But the general refused to appear himself with mere opponents and instead put up a clock in his allocated time. But the appearance of the others on TV for the first time reintroduced the famished French to the joys of opposition. So television suddenly showed new faces. Mitterrand suddenly appeared. So most people thought, good God, there's a challenger. And the same thing happened with uh, someone who's forgotten now, uh, Monsieur Le Canry, a centrist leader who was called uh, Mini Kennedy, he had beautiful white teeth. Voici notre première rencontre. Le Canway was a sensation on television. As a result of these broadcasts, de Gaulle did not gain his customary majority on the first ballot. So we had the second ballot between Mitterrand and de Gaulle, and then de Gaulle has to use his uh, television hours and uh, he needed it badly, badly. To win back public opinion, de Gaulle forced himself to submit to three television interviews. In general, c'est la première fois que vous acceptez de répondre sur l'écran de la télévision. He was interviewed by a journalist. That was the first time he accepted to answer questions of another human being. For the general, this was humiliating. But the interviewer was a friend who gave him the questions in advance. Cher monsieur, il est vrai que c'est la première fois depuis longtemps. De Gaulle won the second ballot. In the next election, he banned the opposition from television. Le Canouet had risen from obscurity because on television he had traded on his Kennedy image. In 1965, Jean Le Canouet sent a group of his advisors to Los Angeles to see me because he considered himself a personification of kind of Kennedy in French politics, but he wanted to know the, uh, you know, how you put it together, how you did it. And Kennedy's television success was on every candidate's mind in the 1968 American election. For his brother Robert, it came easy. The Kennedy style in Oregon. A vigorous walk along the beach. Good for cameras, good for image, good for a place on the local nighttime news. If one candidate was filming on a beach, the others would rush to do the same. Rather dangerously, television, it was assumed, could work miracles. Hubert Humphrey walked at a slower and pudgier pace. Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew walked near the water, but they did not take off their ties or shoes. Republican walking was less wet and more conservative. Television has a believability factor that uh, almost no other medium has. As a matter of fact, when people are asked, what do they believe most? The first thing they believe is television news. And the third thing they believe is television advertising. Every ad man believed that somehow television was important, and their aim was to get their candidate on the nightly news. With no equal time rule on American television, the candidate who offered the most exciting film made the nightly bulletin. The packages reasoned rightly that news would rather show pictures than discuss politics. TV had converted American politics into a branch of show business. Inevitably, Britain copied the American selling machine. But if Harold Wilson was filmed with animals, by the equal time rule, you had to show the opposition as well. If each candidate was on television for the same amount of time, then voters would start to make comparisons. The image of each candidate here would also become important. In the February election of 1974, the television image of Ted Heath presented such a threat to the Labour Party. They hired a film producer, David Wicks, to improve Harold Wilson's image. Edward Heath was presented as rather jovial, overweight and almost 
hand grocer uh, with 64 tombstone teeth and a big laugh. He was nevertheless a very smart image, whereas Harold Wilson was at that time, I think, um, depicted by cartoonists rather cruelly as a sly garden gnome with a Yorkshire accent with uh, tobacco stained teeth and a pipe and perhaps even bicycle clips. The very first thing I did was to get him six new suits. And so when he got out of the car, we made absolutely certain that he got out in a pristine, crisp jacket and a clean shirt and a clean tie. And the ties were identical and the shirts were identical, so he always looked as if he just travelled perfectly and uncreased. And we also travelled a makeup man who kept him made up all the time. You see, he'd seen the American elections. He'd been very keenly aware of what had happened with uh, Jack Kennedy. The way I perceived it was that we were selling a president and uh, that this was the first time that uh, this had been done and I would arrange for him to arrive at the centre of the hall with two spotlights on him. The theme tune, I'm Just Wild About Harry, would blast out of the speakers and the, the spotlights would flash, rather like a president arriving at a presidential convention in the United States. He understood completely the power of the image, he understood television and he understood what we were doing to help that projection. TV might totally affect the way presidents campaign, but in this country where we are electing parties, not leaders, the effect of television on the overall vote is very little. The effect on most people of television is to reinforce the views that they've already had. What television does is to arm them with further arguments for continuing to believe what they've always believed. So why do the political image makers try to manipulate television? If the other side is doing it, how can you afford not to? And I think it'll go on being a matter of, of marketing and presentation because you cannot disinvent it. Thank you. Bye. When Margaret Thatcher became leader in 1975, the Conservative Party hired a former light entertainment producer to change her image. How many lorry drivers? Her hair was changed from this many here. <laughs> to this. She was given humming lessons to lower her voice from this. I think my child might find it a little bit difficult to imitate me. And to no this. one would lend us a penny piece. We couldn't borrow it from abroad or at home. Someone's got her speeches also also contained built-in television graphics. That was the conservative pound. That's the labour pound. <laughs> what one pound would buy in groceries under the Tory government in my right blue hand. What it will buy today under Labour. The purpose of advertising is to add a brand image to the product. Well, the party is the product, and what gives it its brand image is the party leader. And what communicates the brand image to the electorate is television. American presidential elections are two horse races, ideal for television. So to help Ronald Reagan's campaign in 1984, the White House staged spectaculars for television. The Reagan staff have already handed out posters that will be seen by the television cameras on the way to the rally. a television rehearsal for the crowd before the president arrives. The stagecraft has become more and more sophisticated as television has become more and more important to campaigns. Everything in a presidential stop now is planned down to the last detail. There is a, usually a curtain behind him. You see only the curtain, it's a wonderful backdrop. It's, it's a very nice television picture. And the White House understands that pictures on television are as important sometimes as what the viewer is hearing. That many people tune out, in fact, on what they're hearing. And if they see Reagan in a triumphant situation, balloons, people yelling, a lot of excitement, that is still positive. So that whatever the commentator says, if the background picture is good, it's often a positive story. The White House.
White House decides what is available for me to show in the way of their candidate. They know how television works. For instance, these rallies that the president attends, the people at those rallies are backdrops for him to be seen on television. They're all people who support him. They're going to vote for him anyway. They're not people off the street who wander in, but it's all orchestrated, and he flies from place to place so that we can have a different locale. Their only purpose is to be there so that the television cameras can see a screaming throng of wildly enthusiastic supporters. That's so that on television that night, Ronald Reagan can be seen projecting his message, but the message is what's on television, not what's heard in the hall. Two great Americans. President Reagan is not really running scared. In this it doesn't matter what White House correspondent Sam Donaldson says, the Reagan machine knows that his cameraman can shoot only one kind of picture, spectacular as they have created. This is Sam Donaldson. President Reagan set out on this last full week of the campaign to do more than just hold on to his lead. His aim is clearly to produce a landslide victory over Walter Mondale. People start speaking not in paragraphs, not in long speeches, but they begin speaking in what we call sound bites in this country, and that is 15 to 30 second clips uh, for television. After picture control, sound control. Speech writers have helpfully given the president sparkling one-liners. They know television will run that night. They're called sound bites. Last week, my opponent said to the voters, let's forget about the past. If I had his past, I'd want to forget about it too. If my opponent's campaign were a television show, it would be, let's make a deal. You get to, you get to trade your prosperity for the surprise behind the curtain. And if his campaign were a Broadway show, it would be called Promises, Promises. If his administration had been a novel, a book, you would have had to read it from the back to the front to get a happy ending. This has been White House News Control, acquiesced to by television itself. TV got the pictures and sound they wanted, the White House got their man onto the screen, and the serious business of politics was hardly mentioned. But when correspondents tried to tackle real issues at the airport, they got no closer than shouting distance. They don't want to take any risks, and uh, you can minimize risks by not having to answer uh, tricky questions from the press. When candidates discuss issues on television, the chance of disaster is always greater. You uh, have been saying in your television ads that uh, you didn't always agree with President Kennedy. If you were elected president, you'd uh, cut taxes 30% the same way he did. Well, no, I, I don't know what the rate of cut was. I said that he went for a broad-based cut in the income tax. I didn't know whether, I don't know what the percentage of that cut was. I didn't always agree with President Kennedy, but when his 30% federal tax cut became law... Do you remember saying those words? I don't remember saying that because I honestly don't know what the rate of, of tax cut was. Well, perhaps him. someone else wrote them for you I'm, and... I'm sure I don't even remember reading that. But to Americans, less sophisticated in their politics than Europeans, even this didn't matter. Ronald Reagan, through television, has taught them image is all. The big American flag, which is always in the background, is a backdrop which says not only is he president of the United States, he is the country. Physical impressions uh, are, are very meaningful in American politics. One of the reasons uh, that we wanted to debate Carter in 1980 was that Reagan was several inches taller than Carter. And just physically president standing at a podium made him more impressive. Clearly, if presidential advisors believe debates are only this, then the political process on American television faces extinction. The debate, of course, took place and issues were discussed. We can get into a war by letting events get out of hand as they have in the last three and a half years until we're faced each time with a crisis. I think habitually, Governor Reagan has advocated the injection of military forces into troubled areas when I and my predecessors both... Democrats but a day later, all the home audience remembered was Reagan's jokey put-down of Carter, designed for television. There you go again. <laughs> Americans have been taught to take their politics from the screen. So, in defeat, politicians rightly blame television. Modern politics today requires mastery of television. And, and I, by instinct and tradition, I, I, I never li <laughs> I don't like these things. As a matter of fact. Uh, those of us who want serious office must be serious people of substance and depth and must be prepared not just to handle the, you know, the 10 second gimmick that deals, say, with little things like war and peace.
preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. After the selling of the president, now comes the selling by the president. Leaders who are elected with the help of television will use it to project their governments when they take office. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy becomes the 35th president of the United States. Television's use as an arm of government begins predictably with the presidency of John Kennedy. It was reasoned he could use his strength with the medium to put over new policies. So I suggested to the president that we start allowing the press conferences to go live. Uh, it depends on the weather, political and otherwise. <laughs> My reasons for that were not only the impact that I thought he had on television. Television has such a massive effect on changing public opinion practically overnight. And you spoke of using your moral authority as president in the civil rights field. Live press conferences were a way of getting policies directly to the nation without adverse comment first from the press. Kennedy had been well rehearsed. As far as New Orleans goes, uh, it is uh, my position that all students uh, should be given the opportunity to attend public schools regardless of uh, their race, and that's in accordance with the Constitution. It we work up a list of about 100 questions. Of the of the then on the morning of the press conference, we had a breakfast uh, with the president, yeah, and I would sit opposite the president, and I would ask him these questions, but again, in the manner in which a journalist would ask him, not just uh, easy lob questions. And he would say, okay, I can handle that one, I can handle that one. If I will attempt to use the uh, moral authority or position of influence of the presidency. We predicted Warren, accurately about 90% of the questions that were asked in press conferences through our system. Kennedy is believed to have successfully influenced civil rights legislation through the live conferences. The Democratic platform promises to work for equal rights for women, including equal There was even a planned distraction the when the questions got tough. Kennedy always turned to this woman journalist. The ensuing comedy was designed to get the president off the hook. What have you done for the women according to the promises of the platform? Well, I'm sure we haven't done enough, and uh, <laughs> uh, we ought to uh, do better than we're doing, and I'm glad that you reminded me of it, Mr. President. <laughs> In France, where governments had unofficial control over television, the presidential conference was an essential way of manipulating public opinion. The presidential TV conference is a set piece, and it's been so ever since the general started this uh, show. In de Gaulle's days, uh, sometimes uh, questions were fed in advance to some journalists. De Gaulle actually got away with anything, you know. At one point, when they didn't put the required questions, he simply said, uh, I think I heard somebody ask me something about Britain and the common market, and, you know, everybody laughed, and off it went. He had this illusion about being able to control television. You mustn't forget that one day Malraux, Minister of Culture, said to President Kennedy, how the hell can you control such a huge country without controlling television? Ted Heath had a go at using television in what I might call perhaps unfairly a gaullist way. He used to hold huge conferences in the nearest equivalent to the Elysee Palace, namely the Lancaster House, and massed ranks of television and newspaper reporters to announce some new policy. We have been greatly impressed by the arguments of the employers and the TUC. But what does anybody appear on television for as their politician except to influence public opinion? They don't appear just to use up time. Of course they appear to influence public opinion. Mr. Heath thus facing his third presidential-like or Pompidou-esque press conference. The need for balance on television in Britain presents government with a problem. Ted Heath was trying to get over controversial policies on TV without giving the opposition right of reply. Normally, they're allowed a ministerial broadcast. The press didn't like this very much because it was a rather artificial occasion. Parliament didn't like it because it was a bypassing Parliament. So I don't think it is as easy as it is under the American system when the president can call on the networks to take this national program tomorrow because American troops have gone into action. Richard Nixon demanded and got airtime for over 20 broadcasts that helped him extricate the Americans from Vietnam. Good evening. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. If one can learn to use it effectively, it can be a very powerful instrument in going over the heads of the Congress, going over the heads of the Washington media and so forth, directly to the people. Premier Cho Enlai, on behalf of the government of the People's Republic of China, 
has extended an invitation to President Nixon to visit China at an appropriate date before May 1972. Mr. Nixon arrived in China in time to be on live and prime time in the United States. And so you, you manage events. The timing on television when people are watching it from a political point of view is all important. There's managing of news, for example. It's common practice now to have so-called media events. Nixon's visit to the Great Wall of China was a media event. Stage managed to be carried live by news bulletins back in America. And by stopping the plane in Iceland for five hours, the triumphant return to Washington was timed live for the evening news as well. Leaders become jealous of the power they believe television has. After such clever control of timing, it followed that the Nixon White House would want to try to control news content as well. I think any president is obsessed by television. He felt that television in particular was unfair and had undue influence on the American public. So Nixon had Spiro Agnew, his vice president, threaten the very independence of the news networks. Is it not fair and relevant to question its concentration in the hands of a tiny enclosed fraternity of privileged men elected by no one and enjoying a monopoly sanctioned and licensed by government? There was even a sinister attempt to get television to take White House sponsored documentaries about the Army's role in Vietnam. This was an idea uh, put forth by Charles Colson, who would like to manage everything, including the news and the reporters and anything he could put his hands on. Uh, I opposed it, and he independently went to the networks and tried to get them to do it, and rightfully they turned it down. Politicians are jealous of the power and influence of television news. In India, the world's largest democracy with its free press, television news is also controlled by making it part of the Ministry of Information. Five, four, three, two. The Congress S has authorized the party president, Mr. Sharad Pawar. While you're going through extremely difficult phases of development and you have a long way to go, this is the time of the greatest expectations as well as the greatest disappointment. So there has to be some medium which helps to hold people together and pro projects a national point of view. Projection of the leader is a vital part of that process. The Ministry of Information ensured Mrs. Gandhi was filmed each morning meeting village delegates at her residence. This would frequently be included in the nightly news. On TV and radio, we expect to give a government point of view also, because here, you know, the government doesn't have any paper of its own. <laughs> the press uh, here tend to stress what is wrong rather than what is being achieved or what is right. But journalists from India's well-run independent newspapers are highly critical of government propaganda in the nightly news. The government owns the entire radio and television. And today, it really believes that the function of radio and television is to lie on behalf of the government. The resolution also called upon the Prime Minister to call a meeting of political parties to suggest... Little do they realize that nobody believes the lies. The government television can go on broadcasting that, yes, prices are falling. But your wife and you have to go and purchase the vegetables. The Shah of Iran must have controlled the radio and television. He must have probably dominated the entire printed word. How many must do it today? All his controls did not save the Shah in the end. In Italy, the political parties have a unique system of television news control. They have separate channels. This is the news crew for the socialists off to cover a major political story at the Italian parliament. The Christian Democrat or conservative crew arrive to cover the same story for their news channel. E non è prevista in alcun modo un'adeguata copertura. They are both filming a new bill in Parliament. The socialist-led coalition are introducing a controversial budget that will be the lead story on television that night. The socialist team are happy simply to tape the new proposals. 
However, the Conservatives working in the lobby of Parliament are more interested in critical arguments from their own MPs. Channel One, the Conservatives on air. They are naturally hostile to the government. Sul decreto anti-inflazione il governo porrà la fiducia anche a Montecitorio per superare... In the studio next door, at the same moment, two, the socialist channel, are being more positive towards the government. This system may satisfy the political parties, but for the viewer getting most of his news from television, there is only confusion. In Britain, governments insist news and current affairs remain politically impartial, but the government's own appointed watchdog for independent television, the IBA, have in the past stepped in to ban controversial programs they believe are not in the public's interest. The authority banned this edition of World in Action in 1963. It was about a politically sensitive subject, defence spending. Sea Slug is Britain's oldest guided missile. It's an anti-aircraft weapon. But the planes it was to be aimed at became obsolete years back. The first estimated cost of developing Sea Slug was £1,500,000. The actual development cost was £70 million. They banned the defence spending programme on the grounds, first, that it was inaccurate, and second, that it gave a distorted picture of the defence budget. The truth of the matter was that the ITA itself was shocked and knew that the government department concerned would be shocked, and they could not bring themselves to believe uh, the degree of careless expenditure that was going on in the services at that time. So they took the instinctive reaction of saying no. This programme was also banned. The county court at Wakefield, Yorkshire, scene of the Pelson bankruptcy hearings, the most sensational in British legal history. Under scrutiny, one man's relationship with scores of councillors, local government officials, top civil servants and senior members of parliament. There were people there who, again, thought the programme would subvert the orderly, proper government of this country by local authorities, by government. They were protecting what important people often protect, which is the body politic, which means not only the government, it means everyone who's concerned with seeing the country is run in an orderly and proper manner. <laughs> In a democracy, politicians have the right to use the powerful medium of television. But in return, they must expect to be cross-questioned. Thank you, Mr. Day. Uh, I hope when you next interview me, you don't interrupt quite so often. Uh, Mr. Brown, it is, a it is a little difficult interviewing somebody down the line, and uh, I hope that you don't uh, take it... It's quite a little difficult being interviewed down the line. I hope you don't take it personally. Not Mr. a bit, Mr. Day. I like you immensely, but you must understand the rules by which we do this. May I call you brother? If you wish, Thank I would be very flattered and delighted. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Brown. Goodbye, Brother Day. Oh, I think the viewers are very, very wise to worry about the, the uh, politicians being <coughs> able to use the media in a, in a propagandarish way. And I think the price that politicians should pay for access to this medium is that they should be questioned effectively, responsibly and expertly. Mr. Day, you've been an interviewer for a long time and you knew before you even phrased the question that you wouldn't get me to comment on that particular matter in the light of what I've said to you. Uh, now, ha have another try if you like, but you won't get any further with it. Why not turn to a more profitable line? Because it's a matter of great interest well, to in a lot case, of people you'd here. you better discuss it with Mr. Jenkins, but you're not going to get me to make statements that you'll then throw at Mr. Jenkins and try to set us at each other's ears. I'm not going to take part in that game to satisfy a television panel. Now, then let's turn to something else. Now, do, you, do you think that a deputy leader... No, I'm not answering any questions about what a deputy leader should or should not do. Now, please go on to something else. The politician wants to say what he wants to say on television. He wants to avoid saying what he's afraid you're going to try to get him to say. So you've got a natural uh, confrontation. And, of course, John Kennedy, the first politician to realize the potential of television, knew modesty was a television virtue, too. As you look back upon your first two years in office, sir, has your experience in the office matched your expectations? Well, in the first place, I think the problems are more difficult than I had imagined uh, they were. Secondly, there's a limitation upon the ability of the United States to solve these problems. Uh, we uh, are involved now in the Congo. Very well.